Yeah, well, this is our man, James Nicholson, 23-year-old from London. This is his first point of contact in the Second World War, right? Above Southampton, flying along in his hurricane. Next thing he knows, bom, 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 bom. This is the loudest thing this man has ever heard, right? He gets four Messerschmitt cannons at him. One of them shattered the glass on his cockpit, ends up with a bit of glass that rips his bloody eye off, so he's pissing with blood, can't see out for blood. The next cannon rips the leg off his trousers. The other cannon blows his foot after bits, and the fourth cannon blows his bloody fuel tank up. All planes of fire, yeah. So he starts unstrapping himself out of his hurricane, <laughs> and what happens, here he is in his hurricane, what happens, he comes across the Messerschmitt that's just shot at him, and he's behind him, so he thinks, hang on, <laughs> I'm not having that, I best get back in my hurricane. Nicholson wants to go faster so he can catch him, so he puts his hand into the burning, like the, the, the big pit of flames where the throttle is, um, to put the throttle flat out. He can see the bones of his hand because the skin's on fire. You what? Right, to chase him, right, the Messerschmitt's trying to dive out of the way. James gets into a dive 400 mile an hour shooting at the Messerschmitt. Shoots the Messerschmitt down, Messerschmitt goes down and crashes. Right, back to where I, where was I? Oh, I was trying to get out of my plane. Gets out, parachutes out, floating down to the ground. Home guard sees what's just been happening. That's obviously the German pilot. I'll shoot at him with my pellet gun. So <laughs> James ends up with pellets in his ass from a bloody air rifle. So you've just gone through all that and you got bloody shot up your ass from a pellet gun. Hey? Anyway, a butcher's son sees what's happening runs up to the home guard, lamps the home guard, gets to James, um, yeah, all is well, gets into hospital, and he survives, he survives, which is a bloody amazing story, right? And after all that, he is awarded the Victoria Cross, the only Victoria Cross awarded over the whole Battle of Britain from Fire Command. But James does the very British thing, and he's too embarrassed to wear the VC. Used to get told off for not wearing it. Fair play. How very British. What a boy. What a boy. Right, our man Ray Holmes is only 26, out doing a bit of a saute over London, comes across three Dornier 17s, right? Dornier 17s, lightweight bomber. He thought they was going to drop bombs on Buckingham Palace. So the first one, it goes for him. He's got an effing flamethrower. A Dornier 17 with a flamethrower. Anyway. He dives under the first man, shoots him down. He gets covered in all the oil from the bloody flamethrowers. That's the first man out of the way. Gets to the second Dornier 17. <laughs> shoots him down, right? Somehow the pilot manages to get out of the Dornier 17. Um, Ray flies underneath him, but then the parachuter, paratrooper, parachuter, parach... Anyway, the pilot with a parachute on <laughs> ends up landing on his bloody wing. <laughs> Nearly takes him down. So he shakes him off. Um, that's two of them out of the way. And then the third one goes for him head on, no bloody bullets. And he thought, shit, what am I going to do here? What am I going to do here? He's out of bullets. He doesn't want the last of the Dorniers getting to Buckingham Palace. So he goes full kamikaze and takes the back of the Dornier off with his wing. And takes his wing off in the, in the meantime. So he jumps out, parachutes out, lands in the middle of bloody London. And these civvies in the street had seen what was going on um, and said, bloody hell, Ray. That's what I didn't know his name. Bloody hell, Ray, you've done a fair job there, mate. <laughs> and he gets swammed in, a couple of young lasses. Anyway, so that's Ray's job. Done and dusted. Um, Manda Cake had the icing on it. Fair play, oh boy. You all right, boss? Do you want me to get in there now? She's cosy. What a job. This is mega. I'll tell you what, I like it. There's three million of these, three million. And you could buy them for seven quid a piece, which works out to be like 400 quid in today's money. Or if you earn less than 250 quid a year, let me get that right, that's equivalent to 14 grand a year in today's money, you got one for notes. You have to build it your send, mind. You have to build it your send. But it's a job to get six people in here. It should be cozy, wouldn't it? Not for the piss part. <laughs> You wouldn't be very popular if you was curling a number two out, would you? Hey? <laughs> They'd be wincing in here, wouldn't they? Do not be alarmed by noise in an air raid. Have I got my earplugs? I'm 
I'm nervous. That was a fair wallet. Oh, my language. Oh, that's a rattle, boy. Yeah, we haven't knocked out off the shelves yet. My language again. <laughs> I went with a row. Is that the last one? Fucking hell. Where was the nearest one? That one there? Brand new. <laughs> Good work, boys. Number one, wait until you see the whites of his eyes fire short bursts of one or two seconds. Right, so wait until you see the wire. That's a bit optimistic for me, that. I mean, you're doing 300 odd mile an hour in a Spitfire's and Hurricane, 300 odd mile an hour, right? And you've got your man and your measurement coming towards you at 300 mile an hour. Wait until you see the whites of his eyes after you, mate. Whilst shooting, think of nothing else. Brace the whole of your body Concentrate on your ring sight. Always keep a sharp lookout. Height gives you the initiative. Always turn and face the attack. Make your decisions promptly. It is better to act quickly, even though your tactics are not the best. Never fly straight and level for more than 30 seconds in the combat area, which you can understand that. It would be fairly easy to get picked off if you did that. When diving to attack, always leave a proportion of your formation above to act as top guard. Initiative, aggression, air discipline and teamwork are the words that mean something in air fighting. Alright? Go in quickly, punch hard, get out. That's number 10. Night out in Grimsby. That would be a night in Grimsby, wouldn't it? To be honest, I thought going on with more Cleethorpes now. You'd, you'd, you'd start your night in Grimsby, then you'd go to Cleethorpes, and that's how you finish your night in Cleethorpes. You'd go in quickly, punch hard, get out. It's time for Guy to get some advanced flight training. OK then, Guy, do you want to hop in? Oh, as soon as that? Yeah. All oh, right, grand job. He's going to try his hand at the world's first flight simulator, the Link Trainer. All yourself in. Invented in 1929 by Edwin Link. Yeah, that's me in. Most of its parts came from his father's piano and organ factory. What an amazing piece of kit to have been yeah, thought of a yeah, thick end of 100 years ago. With all its bellas and valves and levers and linkages and rack and pinions and gubbins on gubbins on top of gubbins. Oh, he's free flogged them all over the world. Yeah, like there was German pilots found out to have done 50 hours on link trainers. I'm going to explain what the instruments are and what they all do. If we start top dead centre, yeah. that's your compass. OK. Right? Former RAF instructor Rick Harland now looks after one of the last working examples in the world at the de Havilland Museum near Watford. OK, time to black you out. Ready? <laughs> Ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, let's get stuck in. Right, well, you did. Thank you. Guy's concentration levels increase as soon as he's robbed of his surrounding vision. Can you hear me OK? It now takes him ten seconds to answer a simple question. Yeah. Flying blind can be a stressful experience for pilots. Yeah, I can hear you. I'm just getting behind. I've, I've climbed a bit too much. I'm just over 8,000 feet of that. Guy's about to make a virtual 120 mile flight with zero visibility. We're going to start from where we are, De Havilland's. We'll head down towards Biggin Hill, famous Battle of Britain Airfield. And then we'll take him off towards Tangmere, yet another famous Battle of Britain Airfield. So, uh, a good historic route. Can you read off your heading at the moment? Pardon? What's your heading? 
My head is just uh, 15, 150. Can you come left about 30 degrees, so about 120, 120? Yeah, that's 120. OK, just hold that heading for a few minutes. Are your height OK? Yeah, 180. He's actually moving in pretty much the right direction now. He's batting along at 200 miles an hour, so uh, shouldn't take him too long. I want you to make a long left turn and come round onto about 220. Yeah. Good. About 25 degrees of bank and keep turning until I call you. Yeah. Let me get it round. You need to come left another 20 degrees if you can do that. About there. Yep. Keep the nose up a bit. Stop turning now and go back the other way. So make a right turn. Turn to the right. Yeah. And I'll tell you when to stop turning. OK, roll out now. Stop your turn. That's it. No, we've gone too far. OK, we're going to have to bring you round again. So come back round to the left. Left? No, the other left. <laughs> It's all good practice, as I say. Now we've got it on the right heading. He's doing very well, actually. And hey, presto, you have arrived at Tangmere. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Come and have a look and see where you went. You got fairly close to Biggin. Right. It headed south and we had a little bit of gyrating around the sky. <laughs> and that was when I was asking you to turn left uh, and come the long way around. Right, right. Once we got that sorted out, boom, straight, straight line. There. You can't grumble at that. Thank you very much. Tramping on. Yeah. In 1940, 200 pilots who crashed in the sea died. It would have been even more had it not been for this. Not everything the RAF operated was a plane. Their 100 class high speed rescue boats were called the Spitfires of the Seas. The last survivor is kept in Portsmouth by skipper Diggory Rose. Really, the exciting bit is just to advance the throttles. So if you advance one notch, all three throttles. Watch the speed come up, and we've added two, three knots already. But we're not yet on the plane. So the plane is the point where the hull starts to ride on the surface. At the moment, we're still pushing it through the water. We give it another notch. We're just coming up onto the plane. We're about half the speed she will do flat out now. And then if you advance the throttles as far as you like... All right, we're ready. You sort of lean into it. Yeah, look at that. That's it wide open. Its performance was thanks to 24-litre Napier engines. That was the engine in like the 30s and 40s. If you was land speed racing, if you was flying a plane or wanted load of power in a boat, you would use the Napier, the Napier Sea Lion. Well, this boat had three of them in, 1,500 horsepower. It's like 39 knots, and that's all quicker than anything the RNLI have got now. So what we're doing now is we're going to use a Mary Rose buoy to simulate a casualty in the water. Yes, yes. So this is the stuff that was really pioneered by um, Lawrence of Arabia. T. E. Shaw is in T. E. Shaw. Yeah. So he pioneered this idea that at low speeds, what you need to do is start to use the, the throttles independently. Yes. So as we approach our casualty, which is this buoy here, yes. we can start thinking about backing off the speed. Steering with the rudder is too inaccurate at low speed. So if you take all three engines out of gear simultaneously, right, and yep. it goes nice and quiet. Operating the left and right engines separately means you can rotate the boat more precisely. So yeah. if you want to turn to port, you bring the starboard engine into play and vice versa. It's a bit like the track machine. Speed one track down, slow the other up. That'll help you steer. It's a bit the same. It's a bit the same. Guy has to drive the boat like a tank. Yes. So to come down onto our man in the water, if you go astern, backwards with the port engine, 
and ahead with the starboard engine. Ah, uh, yeah, OK, 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 yeah. yeah. You want to pick him up from right here where you can still see him. Yes. You don't want to pick him up from back aft because then he's dangerous in the propellers. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So we stop the starboard engine and bring both support and starboard astern backwards. That will bring the boat to a halt. Only when you're a flash git can you fly up there at the speed and put it right on the spot. It says the man of experience, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Well, what well, yeah. <laughs> do you do? Yeah. Rescuing pilots was hazardous work. This very boat was shot at by a Messerschmitt 109. Germany's air sea rescue service faced similar dangers. The Germans had air sea rescue, like a Heinkel seaplane, that's what they used. All painted up, big red cross on the side. Um, our man Churchill wasn't having that. He said, um, no, 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 <laughs> they're reconnaissance planes, shoot the buggers down. That's what you just got to say, war is war, aren't you? What would I do? Well, we've got to look at the cold hard facts of the matter. Say, that, that's a German rescue boat, 1940. Am I going to shoot it? Yes, I bloody am, because that's only going to rescue German pilots to get them back to land to get them bombing us again. So, of course, of course, that's war. It is war. The Battle of Britain was a race to get pilots into the air at all costs. Yeah, we're going to do a bit of um, hurricane servicing. 25-hour service on a hurricane, not just any hurricane. This one was an original Battle of Britain hurricane. Shot five enemy aircraft down during the Battle of Britain. So, yeah, it's a proper hurricane. I want to get under the bonnet, you know what I mean? So before I can fly, I've got to sort of understand what does what on knobs and levers and switches and all that sort of caper. Yeah, but we want to see what makes it tick. Now, man, Mo. Come on. Now, Mo. How are you getting on, boss? Yeah, good, thanks. You? Yeah, all right, mate. Can I get you out, please? Sure. Yeah, we're just starting a 25 hour check. 25 hour check, right. Yeah. What's that involved? It normally involves plugs, points, camshaft check, and then uh, a general look around the airframe. That's what I'm waiting for. If you can pull the lead ends off, yep. and then we'll have the plugs out Stop. and have a look. Behind every pilot were at least five members of ground crew keeping their plane in good order. An hurricane was, uh, in my view, a, a beautiful aeroplane. Much easier to work on than, than the Spitfire. Ah, I see. And then it'll drop down, there's some little tags in the top. Yeah, that's a nice fit in there, isn't it? It's a good fit, yeah. Bullet holes and so forth could be patched up with a bit of fabric and dope. You couldn't do that with a Spitfire. And you can see, you know, it's all fabrics are quite easy to patch up and repair. What are we calling that? What are we calling that material? Uh, Irish linen. Yeah, Irish linen. Just dob a bit of that over the top after covering a bullet wound up, and away you go again. Get cracking, boss. Get cracking, Spitfire. No, 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 because that's the structure of the plane. A lot more involved. Aluminium sheeting all over. So, yes, my, 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 I found the Hurricane uh, a better aircraft to work on than, uh, than Spit. Today, interim servicing takes one day of careful work. In 1940, engine work had to be squeezed in between dogfights. Bit on the rich side. That's not too bad. You would ask, can I do a 30-hour inspection on that particular aircraft if it was coming up for time? Now, the flight job would say, yeah, you can. You've got an hour and a half. Make sure you're ready. Give them a clean just to degrease them. Just peril. Yeah, just get rid of the muck before they go in the tester. Probably in a wartime situation, they'd have a set of plugs ready to go. Right. A bit of a grip blaster. See? Brand new? Yeah, that's good. OK. After dry cleaning, each plug has its spark checked and gap adjusted. OK. Enough. Yeah, that's a good one. Spot on. Right. Touch on the thread. Then copper slip is applied before refitting. Just a bit of lubricant when you tie them up. They tie them up a bit nicer and they come out a bit easier. It's like it's never been away. <laughs> it's 
good noise that night. During the Battle of Britain, working in the hangars was just as dangerous as flying on the front line. Yep, enough. Yep. Ready for another 25 hours. Yep. RAF Kenley suffered a particularly heavy attack. Three or four at dawn now, D-17s appeared over the top of the hangar. They were down to 50 feet or just, just cleared the hangar. And they sprayed everything. And I believe they were using uh, time-delayed bombs to let them get away before the bombs went off. So I tell you, I moved and I moved quick. Yeah, go on. But work never stopped. That's you. They got a, a bulldozer in to fill the runway uh, holes up. That's her, boy. Yeah. We managed to do that during the afternoon or what was left of the day. In fact, not a single airfield was ever shut down for more than 24 hours during the entire battle. Well, we got the aircraft to get back again and get our price on again. <laughs> right hand, right foot. Every mechanic was working in the service of a pilot. All right, Mo. Yeah. yeah. It was a relationship. I did tell the boy, I did have a share. Based on respect and trust. Right. What we're thinking? We'll look at the hydraulics, we'll test the flaps. 19, 20 years old. And he's going full belt down a runway. No, I think they took a lot of guts to do that. So if you go right foot down, and then left foot down. These lads are versus schoolboys. And you think if you don't get yourself calmed down, you're going to come to grief in not too long. Stick fully forward. Yep. And then stick fully back. And then we'll go left and right. You've got the odd one who would come back and start looping the loop over the top. And in my word, if the CO saw that, then he was in trouble and he didn't do it again. During dogfights, some ground crew against regulations would tune the hangar's wireless to their pilots' frequencies. I have to say in my section, which I work with radio people, we had a radio set going, so we, we knew what was going on. That was the interchange between the, the pilot and the, the ground control. Oh, uh, you'd hear the tally and and so forth saying, oh, you've, they found them. So you're never sure uh, when you're watching the ground whether he's hit or whether he's, he's diving to get back up. Um, and the only way you would know that is uh, when the bang came or the, the smoke went up. Bad luck or good luck. Enemy bullets weren't the only hazard hurricane pilots faced. Their plane had a dreadful reputation for easily catching fire. As you can see with the panels off, um, the Spitfire had a, a nice aluminium firewall through yeah. there which protected you to some degree. Whereas you can see the, the fuel tank sitting here, it's just open straight down to where your legs, etc., are. So any any hole in here, fuel just poured straight through. Right. Um, right. And the same with the, the wing tanks, which is where I'm sitting now. If they, they got hold, the fuel would flow through, and there's no actual barrier between the wings and the cockpit as they are. Oh, as there is the So if it got a spark and went up, yeah. you've all the hot coolant hoses down there. And if you'd fired your guns, if the fabric patches were gone, you've got a draft through here, and it literally was just like a furnace. Because as soon as you open the hood, it just creates even more, more draft as well. Pretty nice fit there, mate. They do fit well, yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind that the bulk of our pilots were. Uh, the better trained. Look at that, Mo. There's no doubt about it. They destroyed, didn't they? Completely destroyed uh, the German Air Force. Well, oh, thank you very much, boss. You're welcome. <laughs> Never lets us down, does our Mo, does he? Hey, <laughs> the man. The man. Let's see if it will start first. Yeah. My father's name was Miroslav Ferich. He was a very adventurous young boy. 
He was mad keen on flying. There were a lot of spare planes around at the end of the First World War, and particularly in Poland. So there was a lot of flying going on, uh, and he spent every hour he could up at the local aero club. The Poles were trained to fly in tight formation. In fact, they attached cords between the wingtip of one aeroplane and the wingtip of another. And they were made to take off and fly and land like that. Another uh, piece of training they used was to fly head-on at each other. To, and they used it to scare people. Uh, I mean, you know, if you've got a, 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 another plane flying straight at you, uh, it's quite unnerving. And so, you know, and they were told you must not break until the last possible minute. Uh, and some of them got quite hairy. Uh, and, you know, they were roundly uh, shouted at if they didn't, if they broke too early. The Poles had already fought a short war in Poland. They'd actually lasted and held out longer than the French did. Uh, and which a lot of people don't realise. Um, and, uh, but they had seen this absolutely vicious blitzkrieg overtake their country. They'd had to leave their families. A lot of them had been, had been killed, murdered almost. Uh, the, um, their homes had been razed to the ground, and they lost their country. They've got a lot to fight for. The first day of operations was a real success. A flight went up, that was the flight my father was in, and the Poles were such good flyers, everyone got a German. Apart from that, I suppose, was his contribution on Battle of Britain Day, when he managed to put two Messerschmitts out of action. To get two was good. What did they do when they were off duty? I think most of the time was spent in the orchard, which was a very popular pub in Ryslip. If you happen to have a friendly squadron commander, who had a large open Rolls Royce, he might even run you down to the pub in it. You get 12 people in that car. Not only were they taught to fly incredibly well, they were taught that officers were also gentlemen. And there was a code, this bowing and clicking and kissing of hands. And that you, if you were, whenever you called upon a, a, a lady, you took flowers and you kissed hands before, as you arrived, and you kissed hands when you left. Uh, and it was drilled into them that that's how you behaved properly. Didn't always go that way, but, you know, in, in, and in the pub, well, there were a lot of young women around who saw these rather dashing foreign people in, in, uh, and heard the stories about them. And they, they did become the glamour boys of England, according to the daily papers, uh, and they were incredibly popular. Uh, not so, perhaps, with the RAF officers who were in the pub, uh, and there were a lot of jibes and comments about the polls, and um, it did get a bit heated at times. But the women, oh yes, they, they love the polls. Um, but then my mother was one of them. This is... Uh, an extract from uh, a letter by uh, Air Vice Marshal Stanley Vincent, who was the uh, Northolt station commander at the time of the Battle of Britain, who uh, couldn't believe in the early days what the Poles were doing and what they were claiming for victories. We had a wonderful 100th hum party in a dispersal pen with officers and airmen of the squadron surrounding a long line of tables with bottles of whiskey, gin, sherry, port, beer, etc., arranged down the middle. The hosts of the squadron, i.e. the pilots, mixed cocktails for the few of us who were guests, which consisted of a tot out of every bottle in a tumbler. After one or two cocktails and some really good singing by officers and airmen, I had the honour of being tossed in a blanket, but without the blanket, we were all very good friends. <laughs> Quickness of eye and a sense of alertness are two essential qualities in men of the Observer Corps. Um, oh, come on, go 
back, those guys will go back. That's a Stuka dive bomber with those big fans underneath that created this massive howl um, when it went into a dive. That was the whole idea of that. Dive down, get as near to the bomb tight as you can, drop the bomb, get away, get back. But it wasn't that fast. If we caught up, the Spitfires and Hurricanes shot down. That's Iron Call 111. That's the top view of that plane. Is that Dornier 17? Yeah, flying pencil, Dornier 17. Oh, I think that's a Messerschmitt 110. Oh, the nickname. You don't mess with this. It's the Destroyer. <laughs> the Destroyer. It was that Gurin that named it that? <laughs> you want to destroy it a lot with that, mate. <laughs> that's a Messerschmitt 109E. Top view of it. Big old cannons here, big old cannons. Got in the way of them, boy. Junkers 88. Yeah, it's a twin engine bomber. Not a lot of carrying capacity, not that fast. And with so many different types of Allied and enemy planes in existence, it's no simple matter. The Observer Corps are the country's eyes and ears. Yeah, it's quite easy just spotting them on the projector here, but if you was out in the field and you had to radio through with confidence what you would see, yeah, that would put a little bit more pressure, a little bit more pressure on you. You would nearly go as far as saying that that is priceless. Douglas Bader's faults late. Yeah, eight year old, but look at the linkage. Look, can you see what I'm doing there? Look. Oh, that's 80 year old. Well, nice. I don't know, that's a pretty maybe fair statement. Would he have been the most famous Second World War fighter pilot? We all know the name, don't we? I mean, he was well respected, but he wasn't very well liked amongst his um, fellow pilots. Yeah, he yeah, lost his legs sort of showing off. Someone dared him to do a roll straight after takeoff. <laughs> it didn't quite go to plan, lost both, lost both his legs. Um, and then he was a civilian, and then Second World War was getting up and going, and he wanted back into the RAF, so they put him through a load of tests, um, they let him fly again, um, and, he was, and he was an amazing pilot. And he could pull, they reckon, he, he reckoned, he could pull tighter turns in a Spitfire, or a Hurricane, he was a Hurricane man, he was a Hurricane man, he could pull tighter turns um, without his legs, because obviously if you're going into a, a lot of like, positive G, the blood rushes to the lowest point, which is your legs, but he's got no legs for the blood to run to, so he could, he could pull tighter turns. <laughs> he had a very successful Battle of Britain, really. Seven, he had seven downs, yeah. Which is, which is yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, yeah, but compared to some of like, the Polish lads, there was a Polish lad who shot 17 down. So, yeah, but we don't know about him, do we? We know about Douglas Bader doing it without any legs. And then, not long after the Battle of Britain, um, shot down, captured, spent the rest of the Second World War in Calditz. What an honour. How many boys can say that? They've held Douglas Bader's false leg.